Oh boy, we got a big one this week. He is an 18-time FLW Cup qualifier. He's a six-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier. He's a four-time Angler of the Year with over $3 million in winnings. From somewhere deep in the heart of Texas, Clark Wendlett joins me this week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. So here we go again. Welcome one, welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You guys know the drill. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. Welcome in. This is episode 132. The average podcast lasts for seven episodes, so we uh, we are above average, uh, at least in that department, and I thank you guys for tuning in. If this is your first time tuning in ever, uh, I hope you dig it, and I hope you give us a like and subscribe and do all that stuff that will make us um, streaming cool or YouTube cool, wherever you're watching it. We thank you for tuning in. Um, and there is so much going on in the fishing world right now that I probably should be talking about. Um, I should be talking about the nine new qualifiers for the Bassmaster Elite Series. Um, there's a bunch of different stories. There's rumored stories of stuff going out, coming out in the fishing industry this week. May have come out, may not have come out. I don't know. There's all sorts of rumors swirling. But here's the truth. I'll be honest. I mean, I'm always honest to you guys. Um while all that's going on, I'm going fishing. Um, I'm pre-recording this show because uh, I'm shooting a brook trout show. And uh, normally, I'm well, I'm shooting the brook trout show when I'm normally recording this, which is closer to the air date, which so I'm probably missing stuff like congratulating the nine qualifiers from the Bassmaster Opens, the final open winner of the season, congratulating that person, um, and, and, and dealing with said swirling things that are happening in the fishing world but um i've gone fishing so um we're not going to deal with any of that this week next week we'll talk about all the doings and what's going on in the world and um we'll cover a bunch of stuff with the opens um gotta have jake latondras back with jake's take here in the next few weeks to do kind of a wrap-up of the opens because he was uh, there shooting them and all that and so many more things coming up. But this week, we got a great show. Um, and this is a dude I tried to do a show with for a long time. Um, the beginning, before this season started, we were scheduled to do one. And then um, <laughs> Texas got an ice storm. So he got shut down. So there's always been reasons where I couldn't do it or he couldn't do it. But I'm happy he can do it now because he truly is... I mean, a future Hall of Famer has to be. I mean, you look at what he's accomplished in the sport. He's been on just about every cereal box there is out there. He's a good dude, you know? So whether you became a fan of his from his early, early Bassmaster days, from his FLW days, or from his days on the Elite Series now, I'm a fan of him. And uh, I'm a fan of just getting right to the guest and doing a lot less blabbing. So let's uh, go somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. And hook up with the one and only Clark Wendlett. Clark Wendlett, we have tried to do this for a while. We were stopped once by an ice storm. But even though you're at your hunt camp, you made time for this. And, and I appreciate that because you're no different than most of the Elite Series. Your hunting time is a very, very valuable commodity in your world. Well, it's something I I love doing, and and to me, hunting. You know, I, I listened to your podcast last week with uh, Perosnik, and I and I and he was trying to put into words what hunting means to him. You know, so I kind of thought about that, and I thought, well, you know, for me, I'm just absolutely as intense about hunting as I am fishing, and if I'm not doing one, I'll be doing the other. And so, um, hunting just happens to be a two month deal, and fishing a ten month deal for me. But, um, I just, I mean, I love it. I'm passionate about it. I like, I like chasing and trying to figure them out just like I do bass. So hunting for you is you hear some guys talk about how that's their decompression time. They need to sit in a tree and just reevaluate the year. And, you know, look at, it sounds like you are, have your foot on the gas, whether it's fishing, hunting, you want to do well. I mean, it's not a relaxation thing for you, is it? Well, it, 
I, I just it's think it's my it. place I'm happy. It's what I, it's what I enjoy doing. I enjoy like like I got the greatest job in the world because I get to go chase bass and try to figure them out. And my favorite is big fisheries, um, going and trying to figure out like places where fishing pressure is not going to affect you. And so in hunting, I'm the exact same way. I want to go to the biggest land I can find um, where it's the wildest possible country and try to learn how to see if I can't match wits against the biggest one I can I can kill. So whereabouts in the world are you right now? I'm actually at our ranch, um, which is kind of more or less in central Texas, um, kind of in Mills County, but near Brownwood, Goldthwait. I mean, in the middle of nowhere, Texas. Um, but I also hunt a lot in Mexico, in old Mexico. So wow. um, I do both. All right. Well, I'd just like to take a moment to um, show that a lot of guys who are living at home and don't have as good Wi-Fi as you have in the middle of nowhere. So it, it I appreciate that. Um but this is a fishing podcast, so let's let's get on with fishing. But uh, when you when I when I thought about this conversation, I'm like, man, where do you go? I mean, you have accomplished so much in the sport; you've seen it all come and change. But let's start with this past year. How are you feeling about your past season and uh, and where you're at with your career right now? Well, when when I started bass fishing for a living and and you know i started with bass way back yeah. in 1992 i had just mm -hmm. come off winning the red man all american which is what it, you know the bfl all americans called used to be called and um the very first term i ever fished was at st lawrence river in clayton new york i, I mean i knew nothing about it but i just i i got a love for for those small mouth and that's kind of where that love affair started um but as far as um, where my career and where it's gone, you know, longevity is the thing that I really can hang my hat on. I've been doing it competitively and done well for a long time. And, um, you know, I, it, looking back, do I wish I'd have won more? Well, yeah, everybody can see the ones that got away and you, you know, hindsight's 2020, you can say, well, yeah, I, I wish I'd have done this and I'd have won this tournament, or I wish I'd have done that. And I'm a lot better fisherman than I was back then a lot better. Um, but everybody, the competition's also better. And yeah. so, um, you know, we've learned more and the, the guys early on taught us things, but I've just kept the passion for it. I've kept the desire to want to do it and I still have it. That 92, that's also, was that Davey Height's first tournament too? His seat. It was. You Davey and I actually, uh, roomed together. Um, yeah. not, not in that tournament, but um we we met each other there and so we both started in 1992 and uh and actually I've been, I've been really fortunate in fishing to have great roommates because you know you got to have fun on the road man i mean if you're if 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 the situation you're in is not um conducive to you enjoying it every day then it's not going to work out very good for you. So, I mean, when, when young guys ask me for any kind of advice, I'm like, man, find you a buddy that you like being around and you can hang out with, hopefully share information with and enjoy being around it. Right now I got Frank Talley, um, who's a hoot. I mean, you know, you can laugh at Frank a hundred percent of the time. And uh, Mike Sermon has been a great friend of mine and Davey and I roomed together for a long time before I basically went from bass to FLW and kind of pursued, you know, uh, followed that part of my career. All right. Well, I have to ask you because as you know, me and Davey work together a lot and, and me and him are so opposite. I mean, I, every, my whole life is a disheveled mess. His is all organized and, and his pants are always perfect. Give me some dirt on Davey height. <laughs> on Davey height, man, if I'd have known you were going to ask that, I might've thought of something, but I, I, I'm, we may have to come back to that because I'm not sure I can come up with just quick dirt on Davey, but Davey and I fished really similarly. Um, yeah. we, um, we, we shared information, but not quite at the level that some of the sharing goes on these days. A lot of guys, um, you know, it, back in that day, the compet your competitors, you really disliked them just a little bit, like kind of like hockey players. Don't, yeah. They don't like the opposite team. I mean, and I'm still, that's where I came from. And that's kind of still where I, I have a hard time separating that knowing that I do like a lot of the, most of the fishermen I get along with really well. Um, but I still, whoever I'm competing against, I'm usually mad at, and I want to beat really bad. I think that's a natural part of sports that I think is 
it's weird in fishing. Everybody's supposed to be friends and everybody, and you are friends off the water, but as a competitor, I mean, it's no, it's weird because if you and me are playing a sport, hockey, for example, and it's the first one to the puck, it doesn't matter you, if you don't give your all and try to take me out. Your coach says, well, what are you doing? You're not playing. But in fishing, we're all like, well, you know, it's not me. It's me against the fish. And if it's my time, it's my time. Why do you think fishing's different that way? Well, it's only different in this generation. It wasn't different back in the day. I mean, you know, like I, I'll just pull a few names, but you know, when Ron Shuffield was out there and Denny Brower was out there and Rick Clun was out there and Van Dam, and we were all fishing together, there was a unwritten rule. I'm not getting close to somebody else. And you, you kind of had to earn your respect as you went along, but you once you had that respect there they were going to respect you and it didn't matter you weren't getting close to them because then you were going to have a knockdown drag out that you didn't want to have and um but nowadays these young kids they just are they're just buddy buddy hey yeah i just caught three come over here throw right next to me you, i mean you can get in on this i'll be like man if you even get within a cast of me we're gonna have issues i mean i, I i'm still the same way i don't want to fish with a bunch of people. It, it's just the way I, it's the way I learned how to do it. It's the way I still think it ought to be. I think there ought to be. And now if, if, a if you decide, you know, there's, there's all kinds of scenarios that happen, whether it was your first starting spot or whether it was later on, there's all kinds of different things that can, can transpire, but if they're a lot friendlier today than they used to be. <laughs> so let me ask you this 92, you started out, who was the most intimidating dude for you and your rookie season? Well, for me, it would have been Rick Klun because yeah. he was kind of my fishing idol. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I sat back, I mean, I love, I literally loved the old Bassmaster show. And, and the reason I loved it so much, um, not, not that I don't love today's show also, yeah. but the reason I loved it so much is that they had like three camera guys. I mean, I was part of the whole thing. Cause I, you know, I grew up with it that I grew up watching it and then I got into it and then I did it. And then, and so what they had three camera guys and literally they followed three guys and you might see a guy that just was struggling all day on there. And, um, I, I love the Bob Cobb, uh, you know, when Bob Cobb's talking, man, I mean, to me, and he got that music in the background and, and he's sitting out on the point out there at, at Clayton, New York saying, uh, you know, I don't know if Clark's going to get back, but, and, you know, and, and you're seeing my boat go under waves. And I mean, to me, that's the, that's the Bassmaster that that's what I grew up on. That's why I wanted to do it. So you're back to your question though. Rick Clun was the most intimidating to me. And when I started, He's still pretty intimidating. Um, he, you know, he's a kind of just a different guy, but, but he would have been the one on the water that I would have been the most leery of. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, that, and I, I always talk about those Bob Cobb shows and the, and I, I also wonder if there's a weird little piece of the formula that it was almost more magic then. And I don't know if it's that my age or whatever, but I just feel like, because it was so limited. I mean, it was one show for a tournament. Like you didn't, I mean, you literally watch 40 hours of coverage after a four day tournament now, and you just got to see it and you couldn't find out the information like trip Weldon, which amazes me to this day. He remembers the actual bass info number that after tournaments, you would call up this number and he can tell you the exact number off the top of his head. And they would say, this is the standings in the tournament. And at the time he thought that was, cutting edge and now you look at it it's so available not just through bass but through mlf and all the different organizations i mean everybody's got live even regional tours have live now is there some mat you know what i mean like in the limited you know christmas is special because it's once a year and and That's i also true. feel that there's some of that with Bassmaster and with tournament fishing in general I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, it's almost like the, there's so much information that it just dilutes the really important information a little bit. And so I'm, you know, I, I've often thought to myself, you know, I, I, I think that those shows had the power because it was all there was out there. It was the only way you were going to get information. Your heroes were those guys that were, 
you know, going through whatever they were going through, whether it was Denny Brower running 200 miles uh, to catch a bass or, you know, somebody staying close and fishing finesse, whatever it was, that was what you had to hang your hat on, on that tournament. And you came away from it and you thought about it and you, you dreamed about it. And then when you got back, you were still dreaming about it, but now it's an information overload. There's so much information that that tournament's just another little piece of information. And then there's a, another piece of information here and then there's a youtube channel here and there's youtube i mean you you can find it 24 7 365 you can find all this information and so um you know i i i do I, it was special back then well if we could go back in time and let's say this clark wendlett sitting here could talk to young clark, clark wendlett starting his career in 1992 what advice would you give yourself Oh my gosh, I wish I could have talked to myself back then because I was really good at finding fish and covering a lot of water. I I kind of I kind of I had a KBD kind of mentality, just really not not that I was as good as he is, but I had the same uh that's what I did. I I just covered and I found lots of schools of fish, but I never knew when I had a school of fish that was the school of fish I needed. I was ready to go to the next school of fish if they stopped biting just a little bit and I didn't know nearly as much about fishing, I just could find them really well because I cover so much water and you still got to cover a lot of water. But sometimes um, as we see on Bass Live all the time, sometimes slowing down and figuring out that, Hey, there's a group here that you can win the tournament on. If you, if you do it, you know, if you do it just right. And so, uh, that that's probably the advice I'd give. Other than that, I don't really have a whole lot of regrets. I, the regrets I have is not winning more tournaments. Yeah, but there's a bunch of dudes who won a lot of tournaments that'd be like, man, I'd love to be a four time angler of the year. Why, why do you think you were Mr. Con do you think throughout your career, you were more concerned with consistency than you hear people say things like, well, I'm just going to try win them all. But I mean that you just can't do that if you're going to last as long. Why do you, if that's your regret? Why do you think you have not won as many as as you would? And you've got a Hall of Fame career, dude. Dude, don't even um, like when I say you haven't won enough, dude. You've won a lot. Um, but but I get what you're saying. You're a four time angler of the year. You'd like a few more. Why do you think you did not win as many as you would have liked? I think I, I uh, well, it's a good question, but I, I, and, and to answer your question, um, the best I can is, is I, I, I mean, that's my hang up is, is going, is just going too fast. It's, it's going is, and a lot of times it's, I want to go to the next school in life. I want to go to the next thing a lot of times where I ought to just slow down and enjoy this thing. I'm always ready to move to the next thing. And so a little bit of it's been a, been a life lesson, um, for me, but, um yeah i mean i have i've had a great career and 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 there's i mean the people that i've been around and and being able to do this um for as long as i have i mean to me and being able to still do it and on in all honesty being able to still do it is just as important to me because i still i mean what drives me is is i want to go out there and still whoop them every day that's what i want to do i mean i'm not like just out there just like Hey, I'm, I'm glad to be out here. No, I mean, I, I still want to win. And if I ever lose that, then I will quit doing it for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I wish I'd have won more because I can see why I should have won that tournament or this tournament or, you know, and, and I mean, I'm not talking about five a year, you know, that, I mean, yeah. we're talking about a tournament here, a tournament there, but o over, over time, you know, I, I can think of 10 easily that I, I really feel like I should have won. And and I and I probably finished second or third in all of those. Yeah, yeah. It, it's the other thing that you that I noticed just covering the sport. It's so close. Like literally, it's so, like it, I mean, Swindle is famous for 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 never winning an elite series event. You know, he's won an FLW event, won a a Bassmaster Open, but never won an elite series event. But if you look at the number of seconds and thirds that he has, and right. and it is literally, I mean, one of them he didn't win because of you know he had a dead fish penalty and dean rojas beat him out because of that um right but it's so close it's not even just stuff like that it's like literally one decision you know what i mean it, it's a cruel sport that way i think yeah it can be and you know and i hear guys say well when it's your turn it's your turn and all that yeah maybe so but 
I think people uh, – Swindle, I would compare myself a lot to him. He and I started around the same time. I might be a little bit – I started a little bit earlier than he did. But, um, you know, we've got a similar career. You know, I've won four FL, FLW tour-level events. I've never won bass. I've been second a lot of times. Should have won a lot of them. He probably could say the exact same thing. He's won two uh, elite angler of the years. I've won one, and then I've got three FLW anglers a year. So we're real similar. Um you know, just staying consistent is important. You know, when when I started fishing, the the to make a living in the sport, the thing you had to do is you had to make the classic. I mean, yeah. you knew that. You knew that when you started. You knew how you, and that is the most important thing. And you know, the last tournament of the year every year was brutal then, and it's brutal now. It's like, you know, the guys coming down to the end, it's tough. I mean, you know, and there's all kinds of things that, that are trying to be qualified for, whether it's AOI, that's that's no fun being in that race at the end of the year. I mean, it is fun, but it's stressful. And, and you know, just making the classic is still really the most important thing. Um, it's what you want at the end of the year. You want to be able to say, I qualified for the classic. Yeah, and I, I'm just thinking, but – you saw both sides of it this season, you know, spending time with Frank Talley, rooming with him. I mean, you qualified for the classic, but you were fighting for the classic right at the end. And he was fighting for his career. And, and I think what Frank did at the tail end of the season, if you haven't noticed, I mean, it was pretty amazing the way he charged up and, and kept his career in the elite series, which is worse pressure. <laughs> Uh, well, at this point right now, it's way more pressure for, for him qualifying yeah. for that. Top 10. And I was right next to him every step of the way we stayed together the last three tournaments. And, um, you know, I mean, we talked every day and, you know, I, I, I get to go through the highs when he does well and the lows when he doesn't. And I mean, I love having somebody that I'm traveling with that, um, that I, I'm, I love I want to pull for him. I pull for him all day. He pulls for me. We got a great re relationship. Um, and it's special. I mean, it's hard to find those relationships on the road. Um, but yeah, he, I mean, the pressure was intense and, and, and every once in a while he'd be like, man, I'm just sick of fighting this battle. Well, like, yeah, it's, it sucks. I mean, you know, you're fighting nonstop, whether it's, you know, Welcher for the Angler of the Year and Brandon Cobb, or whether it's me for the Classic and along with 10 other guys, 15 other guys right there, and and then another 10 or 15 are fighting for their career to be able to continue to fish the Elite Series and um, do what they've dreamed about their whole life. You know, Frank Frank's an interesting story because he, he would have loved to have started when I did, but, yeah. but, you know, he had a family and his path just went a different direction. He got his kids all out of the house, and Christy said, man you need to get out there he he did great in the opens made it and yeah every once in a while you're going to have a year like that and when you say it's close it really is close because he and i did the math the other day he finished 70th um and uh he was he was two bad tournaments away from making the classic so if he would have had two decent finishes um in those two really bad tournaments he had that put him in the hole he was in to start with then he would have been in the classic also and so, I mean, think about that. It's not hard to have two bad tournaments. It's pretty easy. Yeah. Why? How have, how have you stayed sane through your career when you're playing a sport like that? You know, you're competing in a sport. And I don't think there's another sport. I mean, you see angler, you see baseball players go and hitting slumps and, and golfers, you know, have off years and stuff. But never, there's no sport like bass fishing. Like, literally, I mean, I Skeet Reese is a prime example. I mean, Skeet Reese for five years battled it out with Kevin Van Dam. It was one and two. Nobody was arguing, you know, and they were both winning, but then he went for like two years where he just couldn't catch him. And, you know, in Van Dam's got everywhere. Nobody is impervious to that. How do you, how do you get out of that when it starts happening? And, and how do you stay sane when this is how you've chosen to make your living? Man, I, I mean, and that's a great question and it's a, a long answer. Um, and, and there's so, so many parts of it because, um, you know, first of all, I, I would be totally remiss if I didn't mention my wife, um, yeah. because she like can get me through some of those hard times because you, you, you self doubt is so prevalent in fishing. Everybody that's listening or has ever fished 
is doubting what they're doing at some point in time. And some guys have the ability to doubt less. Like I would say, Kevin, Kevin doesn't doubt himself hardly ever. You know, he's, he's going to grow the biggest tomato if we're tomato uh, raising and he's going to shoot the biggest deer if we're going deer hunting and he's going to catch the most fish. We're going fishing. So, but some people got more of that doubt and they, and, and I mean, we all do. And, and uh, having somebody at home that can encourage you and say, Hey, you got it. You, this is yours. I mean, it means a lot. I mean, even though sometimes you kind of feel like it might be a little bit hollow, it, it, it's, it's really, it's well meant. And so, um, you know, that to me, that's part of it. Um, but man, that, that mental game, that mental game and fishing is, and I, I do think the one sport that is closest to it is golf because yeah. those guys got all the tools. They're out there and they're hitting, they're hitting, they're hitting, they're hitting. And, you know, Tiger Woods, I compare him to Kevin Van Dam, but everybody else is just a notch below. And so all of those guys that are just a notch below, it's, it's the mental guy that's just a little bit on top. And for me personally, it's really has all to do with what was the last bass I caught? How many did I catch yesterday? That's where you generate your confidence from. You, you can have the greatest year ever. Like, let's just say the year in 2020 when I won AOI had a great year. When I came back the next year, I mean, I literally, if I wasn't fishing going into that tournament, I'd have been thinking, I don't have a clue how to catch one today. I mean, really not an idea, but so I got to spend some time on the water and every bass I catch is one little bit more confidence that I have. And so that's how I, I've got to be catching them good before I'm, you know, really understanding like uh, some years, like around home, I'm sure it is maybe not where you live, but where I live, fishing is just tough. Sometimes it's just not good. You know, whatever the reason, I don't know. Believe it or not, it gets tough here sometimes, yeah, it too. Might, but it, but it, I, what I, I've seen up north, it doesn't get tough too often, but let's just Relative say it's tough. toughness. <laughs> well, what happens is, is that when you go fishing, it doesn't matter if it's tough or not. In your mind, you can't catch them. And so all of a sudden that just snowballs itself into whatever, bad karma, whatever you want to call it. So to me, you need to go to a place that's got them and, and, and that you know you can catch them because it doesn't matter how good the fishing is. If you're catching them, you're going to be way better when you're heading to the first tournament. Yeah. So if you look at your AOY seasons and you look at some of your rougher seasons, what is, like, is the difference in those seasons? And I'm sure you've spent many, many miles driving in your truck thinking about how do I make that happen more and this happen less? Is it all just mental on those seasons or is there some other physical, like, are you just fishing better? What, what, what is the difference to you? I mean, I hate to say it, but I really think it is all mental. I mean, yeah. I, I really, I mean, I think something happens a good, like, let's just say you go to the first event. Let's say it's Okeechobee. This take this particular year, Okeechobee, I finished second in the tournament. I literally didn't know if I was catching one the first day, had no idea. And that day just snowballed into me figuring it out better and better and better. And by the end of the tournament, I mean, I could have caught him the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. It was just like that good. But it all snowballed from, I don't even know if I can get a bite today. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you hate to say that about Okeechobee, but sometimes you're just like, I got, I got no idea. And so, you know, something went right. It went right. It went right. And then all of a sudden it's going right. And that momentum's a big part of it. Hmm. Yeah. No, watching it from the outside, it definitely seems like it's all met. Like, I've used the example of, you know, Aaron. I saw Aaron win multiple angler of the years. And that's when I was on the water all the time doing coverage. So you got to see it happen all season long. But it's so di like those years, he would just be like, they're on that point and make it, you know, he'd be fishing along the shoreline and be like, they're on that point, go to that point. The years when he wasn't winning angler of the year, it was like, mm, are they there? Or are they, you know what I mean? You start second guessing yourself. Second guessing, yeah. Yeah. It's so do you like tournaments better when you don't have a good I mean I don't know that somebody can say I like things better when I don't have a good prefish but it does seem like not having a good prefish makes you catch the fish of that day as opposed to chase something from earlier in the week. And I think that's totally true what you just said right there because what happens is 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 if you feel dialed in like like I I 
I bring up my wife again and my son-in-law who both kind of will talk to me before the tournament starts. Hey, what's going on? What are you doing? And literally both of them will say, when I'm like way confident, like, man, I'm going to whip them today. I mean, I'm terrible. I mean, like they, they're like, oh, we're set, setting up for failure right here. This is not going to work. But when I come in and say, I don't literally know if I can even catch one, they're both like, we're fixing to have a top 10 here. I mean, it's like, and I know a lot of other guys that are like that too. I mean, I hear the exact same thing. They're actually truly being honest to me and then they go out and whack them. Now, when I say I'm not, don't know if I can catch one, what I mean by that is, is I can't predict where he's at. I may yeah. know a lot more than I'm acting like, but I don't know where I'm catching him. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really practice needs to be a, a learning curve. And I, I, we've talked about Kevin something, Kevin, Kevin, he was really good at just deciphering, you know, at the end of the day, put it all in his computer. And he was really good at deciphering what the big bite here, the big bite there and the big bite there had in common to where he could get those big bites in the tournament. And um, that's a really hard thing to do. And so, um, you know, it's uh, that, that that's that's something that the very best fisherman can do really well. So you were a part of the whole FLW explosion and, and it was, it, I mean, I know I work for bass, but you have to give them an incredible amount of, of credit for a lot of the, the great thing. I mean, the two greatest errors in the sport, I think was, was that in the ESPN era, like as far as, I mean, this era will be judged in the future. You can't really judge it while it's right. happening, but, uh, um, but you look at everything that happened with ESPN, but everything that happened with FLW, I mean, dude, you guys were on cereal boxes. You guys, it, it, they were Hulk Hogan was coming to tournaments. I mean, there were, it was pretty crazy. Some of that stuff. What was it like to be part of that? Well, it was, it, it really was, it was interesting, you know, to, to shed just a slight bit of light on it. What happened is, is that um, the reason I left bass, I was fishing both and there was a yeah. handful of us fishing both at the time. Um, Kellogg's was my biggest sponsor. And Bass came along and said, you had to put a beer, I think it was Anheuser-Busch, if I remember right, uh, on your jersey. You had any choice. And I'm wearing a Kellogg's Tony the Tiger. And putting Tony the Tiger and beer together, I didn't get asked to not do it. I just decided at this point in my life, I'm just going to steer that way. And they had the momentum right then. I mean, they really did. They really had the momentum. Um, you know, Erwin Jacob and his er, – Erwin Jacobs and his family really – kind of had a vision that really worked for a short period of time. And there was tons of momentum in it. And then likewise, Bass responded. And then there ended up being, and then Bass just kind of slingshotted off of that. And um, in the middle of it, you know, I'm fishing FLW, so I'm wanting FLW to be the best, but they yeah. just made a lot of questionable business decisions during the, during that day. And, that we don't even need to talk about, but it, it, it kind of spiraled them the wrong direction. And, um, you know, it was a kind of a slow death to be honest with you. So, um, the years towards the end of the time that I was with FLW, um, you know, it, it we, we knew, I mean, like, like I fished it all the time. I had good friends that were in the organization of FLW, good friends that were fishermen. We all knew. I mean, we, we could try to, we, we knew it was going down. And so um, ship was sinking, whatever you want to call it. And um, so anyway, then, then uh, the opportunity came along and, and, and I went with the elites and that's, you know, I couldn't, I, I mean, it's the best decision I've probably made. I mean, other than a fishing decision in my career. Yeah. Yeah. And it's cool to come back to get that opportunity. I mean, there's a lot of people that make, I mean, just put it in any corporate world, but there's a lot of people that I'm going to move to this company because I, I think it's better for my family. And and I've always said, I don't think anybody should judge somebody's decision when it comes to their job. You know, they're, they're doing what right. they think is best for, for their family. Um, but, but most people don't get an opportunity to come back. Um, That's true. So was that weird for you? Like, or what, at that point you were just like, Hey, to use your words, it was sinking and there's a life rope. Hang on. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, when, 
when you asked that question, I thought to myself, I, you know, cause I, you didn't really ask me what moment can I, can I share? Like that was, that was like influential, but I decided to come back to bass. So that, that all went really well. And all my sponsors were like, I, and nothing didn't miss a beat on any of that. Everything was great. But in the very first tournament, you know, so, so I'm coming, I'm coming from FLW. And even though I've been doing this a long time, that very first tournament at, St. John's was big. I mean, for me personally, I mean, yeah. and I didn't have a very good practice, didn't go that well. And I'll never forget. It was, it was during COVID right then. No, it was before COVID. Right really. before, yeah. before COVID. But for some reason I didn't have a, a marshal that day. I don't remember exactly why, but I was by myself. Um, so it was my first day on the water. I'm by myself and I go out there and I literally, I'm fishing through this little canal and I get a bite and I break him off. I don't know why I break him off. I just did. And, uh, and I mean, it's like two hours in a day. I don't have a single bite. I, I rig back up. I sit back down first cast about maybe five feet from where that one was. I get a bite and I catch an eight, nine. And I literally felt like that fish may be the most memorable fish I've ever caught in my life. I got him, you know, like he got hung up in the power poles were down. He got hung up in the power poles. I finally get a hold of him and I literally race both hands in the air. Like I had just won the classic because I actually caught a bass in the elite series and it was an eight pounder and I was all by myself. Not a single person there knew it happened. <laughs> Tournament fishing is that, isn't it? Like I try to explain it to people like when they're like, why not? There's people that fit, love fishing and don't fish tournaments, but it's, I would say it's, it's kind of like putting, fishing on steroids in a good way yeah. in the way that like if you think it's fun to catch an eight pounder it is always fun it is way more fun when you when it's, it's in a, like it's hard to even explain how different it becomes yeah um, it's something about it that's just amazing so did you ever look back at that with you know the flw years i mean i wouldn't say regret i mean you did really really well but at any time to, i mean it was very much like and i've wrestling geek growing up but the the wrestling wars i compared to because it was very much at that time like two tours trying to and it's like that now two tours trying to outdo yeah. each other and that sort of thing but i think at that time it was just so new and so big but did you ever watch the classic and be like oh i miss that well the classic's just different now so yeah. you can't you can't you know the classics just i mean i grew up thinking that the bass masters classic is the greatest thing there you know that you could ever qualify for so so i mean we got to put that one above um but yeah i i watched it and um you know i i i want to win like i'm a huge yeah. like I, i'm the most competitive person and i know i know every bass fisherman is to an extent and most good tournament fishermen are really really competitive that's just something you're going to find in common and I mean, I wanted our tour to be better than Bass. I just did. I mean, I, I'm i sorry, but I mean, because I mean, now I want Bass to be better than MLF. So, I mean, you know, like, I mean, I'm not, you know, it's the way it is. I mean, and it is. So it is better. So, I mean, but at, at that point in time, they were really kind of almost going toe to toe. And, um, yeah, it, it was, I was living right in the middle of it, literally yeah. right in the center of it. And, um, and having a lot of great years, I had a lot of great years and I, and I, and I don't regret the decision to go over there. I mean, family wise, it was wonderful. Um, you know, and, um, you know, we, but it, when it was time to come back, it was time to come back. So yeah, it was, it was, but it was an interesting time. Is it tougher to be a rookie breaking into this industry now, or was it tougher when you did it? Now, I know I'm going to be different on every, than every because I think you may ask that question a good bit. I don't think it. I mean, I heard Swindle's comment the other day on. I don't think it's one bit different now. I mean, I don't think it is. I mean, I it was back, back in that day. You had a handful of guys that were the best guys, and and you and and they could all fish. And there was tons more that could fish. Also, we had different tools. We didn't have forward facing sonar, and we didn't have all the baits, you know, there was just like six or seven, eight baits. I mean, you know, like a couple worms, jig, couple crank baits, a spinner bait. That's it. I mean, you know, it, I mean, when I started, there wasn't even a square bill crank bait. I mean, there, it, it, it did, th there was, but nobody fished it. And then, so then Clun started fishing it. But anyway, um, I think that if, if, 
if me and Davey Height and Van Dam and Jay Yellis, all of us came into this era when we were 18 or 20, you know, say we were the guys coming up, I think we'd end up the same place we were. I think it's, it's just different now. It's different. Yeah. It's different now, but I don't think it's any, I don't think it's any more competitive now. I think it was plenty competitive then. How different is it to compete at, you know, I always say testosterone's a hell of a drug, but like in your twenties, when you say, you know, your twenties, you you know, all those young guys starting out right now. I mean, it's an amazing how confident that they, they are, you know, with as little experience as they have, but that's, I mean, you should be, you're 20 something years old. You should be. How different is it to compete when you look at your years of competition Obviously, over that time, 30 plus years, you have changed a lot as a human being. I mean, every, right. that's goal in life. If you haven't changed in 30 years, you're probably not doing Yeah, anything. I mean, there's something, something wrong with you. No, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and I, it's, so, it's so different. See, what happens is, is you're right. If if I see a young man right now that's in, the, that's in his 20s and he is not full of confidence and bravado coming out of him, he's in trouble. Because when he gets to his 30s and 40s, it's gonna that and that starts going away. It's it's a lot different ball game. And so I, what I know is is all those kids are gonna have that confidence. The hardest time in fishing is when you are you start doubting. You know, like at 20 something, you don't have a whole lot of doubts. Yeah. And you also think, well, if this doesn't work, I'll just go do something else. I thought the same thing. I thought, well, if this doesn't work, I'll just go figure something else out. But when you get to be 30 something or 40 something, you start thinking, what else would I figure out? I don't, this is all I've ever done. All I even know how to do. I mean, I don't know anything. I don't know how to like make enough money to support my family going forward. And so um, that's when it's the hardest time. And, you know, a lot of times also is, and I've noticed this, I'm sure you have too, when guys get comp, I mean, when they start having something else, let's say they're rolling along doing really great. And then they have kids. And all of a sudden there's the kids at home or um, they met a girl and they're going to get married or they're they're struggling at home because they're, you know, what, something's going on in their life. Well, they're not going to fish as good. It's just the way it is. It's nobody can can the distractions other than Scott Martin, the distractions coming from every direction. He can literally Scott Martin can have. 5,000 things coming at him, and he's just as good. It doesn't matter. But everybody else, when they've got 5,000 things coming at them, they literally, like, they can't deal with it. As, as I got to be pretty – I'm a one-channel mind guy. I mean, when I'm tournament fishing, I don't even really know anything else in the world is even happening. Do you think Scott Martin feeds off the chaos? No like, question he does. Yeah. I've never seen anybody like him. I mean, um, he the chaos for him is better. Like, and yeah. I even, he even, um, I, I think he was he, either Suzanne, his wife made a comment to Patty or he made a comment to Patty and said, listen, um, when things got calm for some reason and he just started struggling, he was, he, you know, he needs it. Like it, he feeds off of it when Canterbury is doing this and Matt Airy's doing that. And he's got his kids filming here and he's got his house down there. And this, I mean, he's got things coming from every direction and it's way better for him. Do you think, or what are your thoughts on this? Because I've always thought the reason that you see hockey players go through horrible things at home, but they can still focus for those few hours they play. It, it, golfers, things like that. But is it just the longevity of the competition? You know, the fact that, like, there's other than cricket, which has matches that are two days and three days, which blows me away. But other than cricket, there's not a lot of sports that, you know, most sports are, two to four hours max, but in fishing, I mean, you can't block out everything going at home for that long a period of time is always been my thought. What, what is your thought on that? Well, honestly, I've never really thought about that, but it, but as you're talking, I'm sitting there thinking about it and I kind of think you may have hit the nail right on the head on that because, um, you know, like, like a lot of times I'll come into a tournament and, there'll be something going on at home. It might be just something simple, like a, a bill I was supposed to remember or what, you know, something else. I just, something that I needed to do. 
will literally, if I start practice, I will never think of whatever it was. Not one. I mean, I don't even, I've forgot anniversaries. Wow. I forgot birthdays. I forget everything. I don't even, I don't even know anything else is happening. So guys that when something really bad does happen to them and it, it's in the middle of their competition, I think it does affect them. Yeah. So you're able to block everything, which I think is, is truly what separates kind of the great anglers. Like when you ask a lot of, ang like I look in my skeltered brain, I fish and I think about all sorts of different things, but when you're fishing, you're literally focused on the next cast, the next spot, the next, like you don't ever wander. I've never wandered one bit. I mean, wow. literally from when I start fishing until, um, let's say it's a seven day tournament. So I've got seven days, every minute I'm awake, I'm thinking about it every minute. I mean, I've, I've never not, I mean, I remember distinctly when my kids were young, you know, we homeschooled and my wife, we, we took, took our kids to the tournament. Patty came to me one day and she said, she said, you're, you're going to have to, you're going to have to like realize we're here too. At, at when I come off the water for that, you know, two hours before the kids go to bed or whatever, you're going to have to give us just a little bit of attention. I needed the wake up call. I mean, I needed it because yeah. I'm just so focused. I just can't help it. It was nothing I was doing intentionally. It's just how I'm wired. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, I've often wondered that because you see people who bring their kids in the road, some people that don't bring their kids, but it's, it'd be real hard to back your boat in and not have the routine. And, and I mean, naturally, your kids want to hang out with you. You know what I mean? They, they don't care what you have to rig and get ready for tomorrow to go fishing. Yeah. Uh, it it's, it's definitely, uh, it definitely pulls, pulls on people, but, um, it hasn't always been easy for you. And I don't know if you're willing to talk about it. Um, but I probably should ask, I'd be better at my job if I asked you this before we started, but you had a pretty scary experience at the tail end of, of last year, you know, you were on pace to make the classic went up to Oahe, you know, excited to fish and you take it from there, if you will. Yeah. I actually was in the classic going into Oahe and we knew a year ahead of time that Oahe was going to happen. So I went up there and practice because it's not like a normal place. We go very often. Um, and so I was looking forward to it and we decided to go up, and um and just do a little bit of sightseeing up you yeah. know in south dakota and uh, i woke up i was actually in sydney nebraska and i woke up um at a holiday inn express and and my vision in my uh left eye is just all blood i can still see through it a little bit but it's just looking through nothing but red and um so you know, positive me. I'm like, well, I'm still fishing. I don't, that didn't even come into my mind that I might not be fishing. So we found an eye Institute in, uh, it was in North Dakota, I think, but it was right up that way. Uh, maybe Pierre, maybe, um, Grant, maybe Grand Rapids. But anyway, we, we go up there and when that guy saw it, he was like, I don't, I don't think you, I don't think you're fishing. <laughs> I mean, he was like, I don't think you're fit, you know, cause this was, maybe friday before the practice started on monday let's say and so we were still three days away from practice and he said he said if it was my eye i think i'd turn around and go home and 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 find a really good doctor and get it figured out and so you know at that point we kind of thought maybe it was a detached retina um what it ended up being is a uh, i'm a i'm a diabetic and have been since i was 12 um and it it's something that diabetics can have happen to them and it's it's called diabetic retinopathy. And it basically, uh, it's where a blood vessels rupture in your eyes. And so the way they treat it, um, they, they did laser surgery on it eventually, but the way they start treating it is, is they stick a needle right in the middle of your eye and it goes, it goes all the way to the back of your eye. And, um, and, ah. so, and they, and I still get those injections. Uh, I'm, I'm down to, uh, one every three months instead of one every month. But, um, the eyes doing good. And, um, it, the doctor there said, I don't see any reason why you're not going to be able to see for the rest of your life. So, I mean, you know, it was scary at the time, but it feels fine now. Um, you had me at the needle in the eye. Yeah. The I needle's mean, bad. It is. It's, <laughs> everybody freaks out on the needle. 
I I honestly like if I ever have issues where I need to put drops in my eyes or something like that, I literally got to hold it open and because for whatever reason, you know, everybody has different parts of their where I'm just always protective. <laughs> but yeah. I don't know that well, I, I could do that. But I I imagine if you're put in that situation, you don't have much choice. Well, you don't you don't have any choice if you want to see for the rest of your life. They're just gonna do it. So that's the way it is. So um. You recovered from that and you're back on the elite series and all is good. You just missed a, a few events. Um, where, where do you, what's left for you in this sport? I mean, I know the obvious, you say you want to win an elite series event. You'd like to win the classic, but how long do you think you'll fish for? Are you going to be Rick Clun? No, no, I'm not going to be Rick Clun. I'm, I mean, Rick Clun's amazing. He really yeah. is. I mean, he's, um, he's kept himself and, amazing shape and um mentally he's strong um i want to do it if i feel like i'm not going to compete at the level that i'm competing at right now then that i don't want to do it anymore and so i would say with that in mind that it's probably a you know a year or every two year you know i, I give myself to i mean because like let's say i made the classic this year to me i that's that's still very competitive in the sport had two seconds had a fifth in the open so i mean i in my mind i had a great season um felt confident um i've had some good time off since this season was over looking forward to next year and i mean i know i'm fishing next year so um you know and after that I just, I, I mean, I'm not going to say I have something to prove because I don't really feel like I got a chip on my shoulder, but I just enjoy what I love about it is, is going and figuring out bass. That's yeah. what I love. About it. And, you know, I love figuring out, okay, you know, is it smarter to, to spend eight hours, you know, a mile away from the ramp, or is it smarter to run, you know, 120 miles and, you know, spend two and a half hours, uh, fishing you know yeah i i love the schematics and trying to figure it out and what the best is and and i, I mean i'm the same way about deer hunting i'm the same way about fishing and that's just what i really enjoy doing do you remember the moment in your life that you that addicted you to bass fishing like the moment when at whatever age it was where you were just i mean had that aha moment where you're like man i i i need to do this forever well, interesting. I don't know if it was that the the I got to do this forever. It, probably I don't have the aha moment, but I did have an aha moment. Um, the it was a it was a, a kid that I went to high school with that he fished tournaments and um, you know back in those days and it was, it was a fellow named Jody Jackson and I still talk to him every once in a while. Uh, he's more of a saltwater fisherman now, but he took me out on a lake right close to where I live and we skipped boat docks all day. And he could, you know, with bait casting rods, skip, skip a jig up under docks and just slung it up under there. And he caught like, you know, whatever, 15. And I, I caught one. And I mean, you know, like before that, I had spent a lot of time in the outdoors, but my dad uh, loved to hunt and fish. But fishing to him was trolling, you know, yeah. for bass or white bass or whatever would bite. And he was going to take it in and eat it. And my grandfather was the exact same way. And that was on my mom's side. So um, I had a lot of people that loved to fish, love the outdoors. But that was the first time I was actually shown you, you really can be better at this than everybody around you if you can cast really well. And, and then, you know, there's so many things in it that go along with it. You know, we, we could talk for hours and hours just about all the little nuances that went with it. But I always love a tournament where casting matters. And to me, um, when, when casting matters, I'm a good caster and I, I can, I, I will say I'm going to usually be pretty good if casting matters. Some tournaments casting doesn't matter at all. I like the ones that it does. So in 92, when you started, I'm assuming you're like most rookies where you were like, I'm just going to test myself against the best and see how this shakes out. I mean, you're, you're confident and everything, but did you have a moment? Maybe it wasn't 92 or maybe it was the first day where you were just like, I can do this, Th this where you uh, felt like. I think I just always thought I could do it. I, I, I think it's the testosterone you were talking about the miracle drug. I mean, literally <laughs> I just thought I could do it. I mean, I was like, 
it was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to make ends meet. My wife and parents, they think I'm crazy, but I'm going to, I'm going to do it somehow. So that's, that's, that's how I got to where I'm at right now. I mean, and I, I had a lot of persistence. I was pretty persistent. So how I think every angler that figures out a way to do it for a living has a pile of people who told you, you can't do this. This is stupid. Go get a real job. Um, at that time, I would imagine the pushback would be even tougher because there was just, it was a lot less publicized. There was a lot less people doing it. Yeah. How much pushback did you get on your dream? Well, I, the only pushback I got was, and I hate to say it, but it was from my wife and my parents. And it was only because they loved me and wanted the best yeah. for me. No, it wasn't like, because they just thought I was nuts, you know, but, um, my, my wife and I made a deal, um, and I may get the facts of the deal wrong, but I was going into the red man, all American. It was the, it was before I fished bass. Um, and, um, I, I think she, she said, you fish this tournament. I'll tell you what, it, yeah, it, it, maybe it was the, it was the regional before the red man, all American. And I won in the tournament and won a boat and a truck. Well, when I won that boat and truck, that kind of answered her like for her, that was her aha moment. And maybe it was for me, but I thought I could probably do it anyway. And then my mom and dad, you know, they, they were going to support me no matter what I did. It, it was just, I think, you know, she, mom would try to say like, maybe you ought to, you know, she wanted me to go to college. So I finished college, but she really wanted me to make sure I had some plan for supporting my family down the road. What, what did you take in college? I, um, well, I started out in, uh, thinking I was going to be a, a veterinarian. And so, oh, wow. um, I started out with, um, uh, biomedical science, which was pre-vet at Texas A&M. And so, um, I got to organic chemistry three or two and I got, I Q dropped it once and I got to the second time around. And I was like, I, I just, it's just too much memorization. I can't do it. And so I switched to wildlife and fisheries and cause it didn't, I didn't, I didn't have to do biomedical science or I didn't have to do organic chemistry two or three or whatever it was. And so I got a wildlife and fisheries degree is what I have. All right. All right. Well, I mean, it sounds like legit education. I mean, there's a lot of pro anglers who did the make mom happy. I, I got a degree in geography and stuff like that. There's, there's a lot of those out there. Yeah, it's, it's legit. And I, and I did do it for my mom. I'm glad I did it. You know, yeah. it was probably a time for me to get prepared to be able to do what I do, what I do now. So. Yeah. Yeah. What's the best part about your job that, that nobody else sees? Well, the best part, the best part by far is, um, is the, the highs that come from it. You know, the lows are the worst and the highs are the best and the highs mean, winning an angler of the year, winning a tournament, um, you know, making the classic, you know, those, those types of things, probably my, um, my very most meaningful times are, uh, you know, Patty still travels with me. Um, and I told you, we talked about Frank some, and I just enjoy being on the road. We're all kind of focused on the same thing, doing good in the tournament. Like Frank's, worried about doing good. I'm worried about doing good. Patty's worried about helping me and, and to a lesser extent him and, and just, you know, having that time to, to travel. And, you know, at, at this point, you know, back in the day, it was like, I had to do it or I, I might not be able to eat, you know, feed my family. And and now it's not quite so much that way. Um, I probably enjoy it more um, now. I, I don't feel the pressure, but I still have the the drive to do well. Do you think there's some truth to the, as you age, as you get older, I feel like there's time where, you know, when you start, you're full of testosterone and you're like going to take over the world and, and you start doing well and you're like, this will be forever. But I think that there's another stage as you start to age where you're like, well, this isn't going to be forever, but it almost like engages you more because you know, it's not going to be forever. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, it, for me, it was it was a three part process. So it, it was the first one you talked about, just like I got this, I'm going to do this, and then and then there was a point in there where and and a lot of it worked around my family. That, um, the girls quit traveling with me and they didn't go to school. We homeschooled them anyway, but they got involved in a lot of activities. One of them was volleyball. And so I wanted to go to their games and yeah. support them there. And so I had this major pull from home. Um, I got on the road and I was all by myself. It used to be the whole family traveled and we was everything was centered around tournament pitching. And then as time went on, they were all centered around all their activities and I'm still trying to make it work. That was the hardest time in my professional career to, you know, keep it going. Um, but then the time when I really got rejuvenated the most was when my girls went off to college. We didn't have to worry about them as much. And and then they got married to two great guys. And um, now we don't ha hardly have to worry about them at all, except we got one grandkid. And, and so, you know, we're having a blast with that. And, um, and I do feel somewhat rejuvenated, you know, over the past, I'm not saying just this year, but I'm saying over the past seven, eight, 10 years, it's, it's been, it's been pretty nice. It, it's weird. And one of the things that I love about you and not just you, there's a bunch of, of, I'm not going to say this in an insulting way, cause, I'm, it, but it, elder statesmen of the sports, if that's the right, you know what I mean? But guys have been around for a 30 plus year career. You honestly bounce when I see you in the morning, you, you are doing what you want. Like, it doesn't feel to me that I think in jets, just in general, whether you work at a factory or you fish for a living after you've done something for 30 years, it's real easy to get crotchety and just be like, you know, you guys don't understand what it's really like. I've never heard any of that from you. Have you always been as positive yeah, I, and upbeat I mean a person? I'm always a glass is half full kind of guy. I mean, I just like, I don't, I mean, I, and, and maybe behind the scenes every once in a while, you know, you, you just your frustration is just like, yeah. ah, this, you know, this sucks. I can't believe I'm doing this, but you know, most of the time it's like, yeah, this is the, I mean, I'll, I really literally almost have to pinch myself. I'm not trying to just paint it in this great light. That's just unbelievable. And it's all bliss. Like social media does. I'm trying to say, listen, I, it, it's not that it's not hard. And we've talked about some of the hard things you and I, but, um, it, it's, it's what I love doing the most. And that's, um, you know, trying to figure out bass at the highest level I can. That's what I really enjoy the most about it. And, yeah. you know, trying to find them, trying to figure, trying to figure them out better than everybody else and then catch them better than everybody else. And so, it, it, it that will probably never change now whether i can always do it i just don't know yeah i i think that's the coolest thing about it i mean you're doing you know how small a percentage of people are actually doing what they dreamed of doing when they were young you know you know what i mean like people want to be astronauts and all these different things but they're not you, yeah you know you grew up wanting to do this and you do it and I mean, at the end of the day, that's what life's all about, experiences. And uh, I think you've had a lot of good ones. Uh, what, are you, what are you scared of? And, and not just in fishing, but just in what's your biggest fear in life? Well, really, my biggest fear in life, you know, my parents just both passed away in the last, you know, two to four years. And I'm not scared at all of dying. Um, but just that slow degradation as you get older is pro would probably be my biggest fear. Just, you know, your the things I love are mostly, um, you know, besides my family and my kids and, yeah. and is my, you know, I love being in the outdoors and um, just, you know, I know I, I watched, you know, Guido Hibden, uh, amazing eyesight. And I watched his eyes go away and um, you know, just being able to be out there by yourself and do it on your own. And, um, you know, at some point that's coming. I mean, you know, it, it does for everybody, you know, even Rick Clun, it will eventually will catch up with him. We know that that's the bitter reality of it. And, uh, but if I, if I had a fear, the ability to do what I love to do the most would be what I'd be the most scared of. I think that's a natural fear. I mean, I think yeah, as anybody so. ages, it's, but you don't have any like, dude, I'm, 
horribly claustrophobic and it seems to be getting worse as I age. You don't have any of those heights, snakes, claustrophobic. No, I, I really, I don't. I, I mean, may, I'll tell you what, I'm about as opposite of you as this. If, you can, if you're going to put me uh, into a, uh, just a huge cluster of people and I'm just going to have to sit there and shake hands all day and, 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 and talk to people all day. I might be a little bit nervous about that too. I mean, I'm all right. in all honesty, I, I can do it fine, but I'm, I'm a little more of an introvert than I am an extrovert. And I, I can, the gift of gab is there when I need it, but it's doesn't, doesn't also, it doesn't come real naturally. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's the number one fear in the world, really, like public speaking, that whole, but that, I mean, it's not like public speaking, but you're, you're, it's so weird. Uh, it, when I look at, I'm like, I'm not scared. I could stand do that all day, but I don't want to be, you know, send me for an MRI and I will crap. Like, dude, it's one of the scariest things in the world for me. And I don't know why I can't, I'm like, there's nothing to worry about. Like I can look over a mountain. Heights don't do, bother me at all, but it's weird how everybody comes equipped with different things that fear different them. Different fears. Absolutely. We've talked a lot about some great people in this industry, but if you had to put a Mount Rushmore of bass fishing, who would be on your Mount Rushmore? Hey, gum, I got asked this question the other day, but it was a smallmouth Mount Rushmore. All right. So it was a pretty easy question, but um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to think of it as just a, Mount Rushmore of professional bass fishing. I'd say Ray Scott, um, because Ray Scott, we literally, none of us would be doing what we're doing uh, if it wasn't for Ray Scott. And I knew him, um, you know, I fished back in the day when Ray was there and, and um, I, I, I admire a lot about him. I, I think he's, um, you know, he, he, he's brought the sport. I mean, I think it's probably gone farther than even he dreamed, yeah. but I would definitely say uh, Rick, I mean, uh, uh, Ray Scott. And then um, I think the next one I'd put on there would be Kevin Van Dam. Um, I just think he's the best angler of all time. And um, it, it doesn't matter what area you put him in. You, you can just look at his resu the results of his tournaments and how he's done over time. And, and uh, you know, I, I, a lot of my career, I, I've, I've tried to fish like him because – he had so many things that got him to where he got because of the way he did things. Um, but, you know, to me, he, he is deservedly, you know, the second guy up there and then um, probably Rick Clun, you know, we talked about Rick, but Rick, you know, Rick's kind of why I got into it. And, um, you know, it, it, I, I'm a, I'm amazed by Rick in lots of ways, and I don't always see things the exact same way Rick does. But um, he, I mean, it's amazing to see him still going. I, I mean, that's you know, hey, what we do is truly a young man sport, and he's not young, and he's still he still could be competitive in any tournament. I'm not going to say at the end of the year he's going to be way up there because the last few years it just hadn't been, but he can still win. And so to me, if you can still win, you got to, you know, that that's pretty amazing. Um, and I don't know who that fourth one would be. That's, that's pretty rough. I don't, I, I don't know. I, I really don't. I don't, I can't even, I mean, it, it might be Denny Brower because to me, Rick Clun and Denny Brower were like the two that separated themselves yeah. the most. Um, <clears throat> and I know Denny real well. And, uh, you know, was amazed by his fishing. And so, you know, in the, in the professional bass fishing world, that might be my Mount Rushmore. It's a great Mount Rushmore. What, what, what is the most embarrassing moment of your career? What is the moment where you're like, how is this happening? Oh man. The most embarrassing. I mean, I hate to say it. Um, I don't have anything that really happened embarrassing, but it, it, to me, it's always a little embarrassing when you go to a fishery that's just amazing and they just crush them and you catch nothing. I mean, literally that to me, that's literally almost embarrassing to me. And I remember this one tournament. It was at, it was an, it wasn't an elite. It, it may have been an, an, Oh, it was a bass something road, but it was at Gunnersville. 
And uh, and I caught one two pounder, and they crushed them. I mean, literally just. And I mean, I mean, I I remember Dan Ro Rojas came up to to me, and he was just walking by me. He goes, "Hey, Clark, what'd you have?" It's like I had one two pounder. I had two pounds. He goes, "How in the world could you only catch?" And I mean, it was just like, I mean, just like brought me down as low as I could possibly get because I'm sure there's other moments that I've been embarrassed, but that's probably the one I can think of. But see, that's, that's what I love about you and Davey Hyde. I'm like, I perpetually am embarrassed. Like every day I do something embarrassing <laughs> and I'm like, you guys have are so locked in and put together. It seems to me. And I'm just like, how, how, but literally every day I do something dumb that I'm, that I feel <laughs> embarrassed about. But <laughs> oh, that's pretty good, but you can laugh pretty good at yourself. I'm maybe not quite as good at laughing at myself as you are. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's a skill. I just think it's what happened. I mean, if you're going to be a screw up for a living, you better laugh at yourself or you're going to go That's insane. True. That's probably true. <laughs> Speaking of going insane, obviously the industry at times seems to be going insane. Where are you at with the F word <laughs> forward facing sonar? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I'll tell you what, you know, Bass actually just put out there, their, uh, you know, there was a, a lot of scuttlebutt that came up over um, after the season was done um, at the end of August there. And so they've been dealing with it for about a month and guys have been writing letters. People have been doing podcasts. Everybody's talking about it. Um, it's a polarizing subject that, you know, uh, you can find just about as many that truly love it as truly hate it. And, um, you know, the one thing that I would disagree with um, when I when I hear uh, the younger generation talking about it is, is that, you know, they, they're just like, you know, I, I hear comments like, well, that, you know, those old guys just need to learn how to use this thing, you know. And to me, what I want the bet, what I want for bass fishing, you know, I'm towards the end of my career because I can't fish 30 more years. So I know I'm towards the end. And so, um what I want for bass fishing is I want it to be in a better spot when I leave than yeah. when I got there. That's what I would hope for. I mean, I think we all would really. Um, it's what we're passionate about. It's what we love. And I just think that bass has got to look at that. Now, when I say bass, I, I think bass is the, um, they're, they're a steward of the sport. I mean, they're, yeah. they're what bass does is looked on by the rest of the industry and, is truly, truly important. And I think that they owe it to the sport to really take a really good hard look at it. Well, if you see what they just put out on the on the letter to the to the fishermen, I'm sure it probably went to everybody, but to the to the elite anglers, and, and they just said we're gonna monitor this for a year because we feel like we need more information. I think that's pretty legit. I mean, I think that um I think we we need another year. We need another year, but I wanted the, the year coming to be where where Bass has already made a statement that said, we're going to look at it and we're going to look at every part of it, not the financial part, not the, OK, well, this fits my fishing style. So it really is the way I want to fish anyway. So I love it. We're Not that, hey, I'm a young kid and I've never done anything, but stick it in the water, look around for a fish and throw at him. And, and not from the standpoint of the old guy that doesn't want to look at it and he wants to skip up under a dock or he wants to throw into a tree or wants to flip grass or whatever he wants to do. I think everybody needs to realize what we need from, from this inquiry is to take a year and look at it and make the very best decision we can. And the one thing that I will say in all the years that I've been doing this, I've, I've dealt with a lot of CEOs in this. Ray Scott started. It went to Helen Severe. Here. Jerry McKinnis got it after that. I've seen Erwin Jacobs in action and Chase Anderson is the best I've ever seen. And the reason I say that is, is because he's thoughtful and he wants to listen to all the people around him, which is what a great leader should do. Le listen to what everybody has to say, the most trusted people, and then make a great, you know, and then make a decision and, and, and stand by it. And so what, to me, what they're saying is we're going to look at this um for another year we're going to use it and um do i wish they'd have done a few different things yeah, maybe maybe limit the number of screens or limit the number of transducers just so just so we're not fighting 10 yeah. transducers going forward but that's just that's just me personally i don't know what the best thing is and i don't know 
I, what I'm willing to say is I don't know the best way. Um, and I want the best for the sport. It doesn't matter if it's the best for Clark Winland or the best for a young kid or, or whoever it's best for. I just want the best for pro bass fishing going forward. Whatever that is, is what I would like it to be. And if it's going to take us another year to figure that out, I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah. And, and I know you're not going to say it, so I will say it because it, it, I hate the whole characteristic where these young guys use it and some of the older guys don't. You're one of the best at it, man, and have been for several years. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know how it's – so it's – I think that's the right choice. I think that tournament anglers are horrible at wanting – what helps them. You know what I mean? I mean it, all competitors. Exactly. I know it's not tournament anglers. It's all competitors. I mean, yeah. the, whether you compete, you want – your decision's a little skewed. Um, but but they're putting together a group, you know, basically a, a committee of different – anglers are going to be part of it and everything. They're going to patrol it all. And and I know for some people they're going to hear that. And, and there's some people, like you said, it's polarized. And there's some people that just want to hear it's gone forever. And, and uh, there's some people that think that's insanity. But I agree with you. I think I think that's where it ends up, to be honest. I think – when it's all said and done, it probably will be limited to a certain extent. Um, but we'll see what happens. One thing I know is Chase Anderson, you can say whatever you want about him. That dude has been tested. I mean, you look at his time as as owner of Bass. I mean, the first year, there is the biggest split in the history of the sport. And then just a few years later, when everything's on cruise control and you're like, okay, this is all going good. Along comes forward facing sonar, which is the most divisive topic. I think I don't rem Do you remember anything that has been that divisive in the sport where, I mean, it's black and white. Yeah. There's never been anything like it. There's never been anything like it. And so, um, yeah, I agree with you on, on the chase Anderson front. I mean, I, I agree with everything you said. I think, I think it's, uh, it, it, it it's going to take us another year looking at it from the standpoint of what's really best for pro bass fishing, because I believe that that's what he's going to do. He's going to look at it as what's best for pro bass fishing. And, and at the end of the day, um, I'm, I, I'm willing to, to whatever he goes with, I'm willing to go with. I mean, I, I literally, I got, I got a lot of faith in him and I, I base that faith on, on just some of the actions, some of the things that he's done uh, up till now. And I mean, I'm not just trying to, you know, sing his accolades but um you know a couple of years ago in the anger of the year deal um they they told us to slow up on our on printing our jerseys because they had a logo on the anger of the year thing and so so we we all slowed up and we were kind of in a waiting game and then all of a sudden the progressive anger of the year thing comes along and our anger of the year pay up payout went from 10 anglers right up to 40 paying big money a lot of money. And so in other words, he gets this sponsor. He had, doesn't have to do this at all. He gets, he gets this sponsor for progressive and he funnels some of the money right back to the anglers. And that just doesn't happen. I mean, we, in, in my lifetime of pro, pro fishing, that doesn't happen very often. And so I, I, I mean, I, I gained a lot of trust in him and a lot of respect. The fact that, and he told me, I thanked him for it. And he, and he told me, he said, Clark, he said, I want this to be good for bass and I want it to be good for the anglers. Well, I mean, to me, that's what you want. I mean, we, we want good for all of us. And so that's, that's why, that's how I feel about it. Yeah. And making a decision from an educated point is never a bad thing. Like a lot of what we've all heard in the last five weeks is emotions. That's literally what it is. That's you know, exactly right. and I get that. I mean, cause trust me, there's as a commentator for bass, there's times where I'm like, like I remember turning to Davey during the Champlain tournament. And I literally said, is this what, bass fishing is now because it was so different than you know there was anglers catching fish that didn't even feel them bite that to me just blows your mind but at the same time it's also a tool that has taught us so much so quickly like yeah. i mean if if nothing else they've taught us how wrong we were in certain certain ways yeah, certainly. that's right it, it's it's a wild wild topic but um Kudos to Chase dealing with that and pass. And um, I'm glad I'm a tournament MC and not in the tournament department because um, it's a tough, tough call to make. But um, yeah, you, it, it is a tough call. I agree. So what do you got to do between now and uh, when I see you in February? Just hunt? Well, hunt a lot <laughs> and uh, and hunt hard and hunt aggressively. And, um, 
you know, spend time with family. Um, you know, awesome. my, I've got two great son-in-laws and I, I, you know, I had two daughters and so I got two great son-in-laws now and they love to hunt too. And so, um, and we're actually all up here this weekend hunting. So, um, you know, I'm I, spending time with them, spending time with Patty and just, you know, the, the fall time's just a, it's just, it's a season. It is a season to reboot. I just don't reboot kind of in a calm way where I'm just really relaxing being in the deer stand. I do relax being in the deer stand, but I relax going at it just as hard as I do going fishing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't want to pull you away from your family and your hunting anymore, but I do appreciate you doing this dude. And I appreciate your candid open conversation. And uh, I'm glad we finally got this done. I mean, last time we were all set to do it and you had an ice storm in Texas, so we c- couldn't do it but we finally knocked it out and uh, thanks for everything you've done for the sport. You're uh, you're an incredible ambassador for this sport. Um, you, you know, and, and here's a bone I have to pick with you. I have every, I think, is it cornflakes? Is that what you guys were on our Wheaties box or which was we were it? on cornflakes? Yeah. Okay. I have every cornflakes box other than the one that you're on. Like I literally have the Denny. You, Brown need, a, you one. need one then. Well, that's kind of what I'm trying to say right now. I'm just, I'm throwing it out there. I mean, Christmas is coming up. <laughs> we can do that. Not a problem at all. Very good. And listen, I appreciate you having me on. I, I, I tell people every single day that I'm fishing an elite series tournament. I, I'm like, man, that guy's incredible. And when I'm talking about, I'm talking about you because you literally can throw out a string of, I, I don't, I literally don't know how you do it, but I, I, every time you do, I'm like, man, he's talented. And, and I appreciate it very much. Well, I'm not good at taking compliments. So thank you. And goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm horrible at it. I can't, I can't take compliments. I don't know, but I, I do appreciate it. Thank you. Very good. And enjoyed it. The one and only Clark Wendlet. So there you have it, the one and only Clark Wendlet. I thank him for his time. I thank him for his candid answers. And I thank you guys for tuning in to this week's show. And um, fingers crossed, I am smoking brook trout right now. So I'm definitely having a good week. And I hope you're having a good week. And we'll talk about it next week. Until then, enjoy being. And as always, Bob Cop, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?